So far, we have studied how to make various decisions using various big data generated during the operation of a ship. However, recently, cyber attacks that infiltrate the ship's network and cause various damage are occurring, and the need to respond is seriously emerging. In fact, in the data published by Allianz Global in 2019, it is recognized so seriously that it ranks second among the top five risks in the marine and the shipping sector. In fact, on June 27, 2017, ransomware NetPetyar infiltrated the computer server of Moscow, which was the world's largest shipping company, where the ships carrying 10,000 to 20,000 containers entered port every 15 minutes and paralyzed all systems. As a result, Moscow had to replace 4,000 servers, 45,000 pieces, and 2,500 applications and suffered a lot of damage. In fact, there are many cases besides us, these cases of Moscow and these cyber attacks are increasing. The following video clip is the content of Moscow's chairman presenting the situation at, at the time of the cyber attack at the 2017 Davos Forum. Then watch the video clip. Did what he thought was common procedure. Uh oh, bad practice. Breaking in shouldn't be that easy. I made sure it looked really legitimate. Logo, layout, sender's email address, everything. Uh, okay, excellent job. Cybercrime is a rapidly growing threat to almost all aspects of modern life, and the shipping and offshore industries are no exception. Onboard systems are increasingly vulnerable to cyber attacks. Safety of the ship has entered a new dimension. So we prepared some fake emails for the rest of the crew, sent from the shipping company, asking them to verify critical information like usernames and passwords and bank information. Today, hackers are becoming more and more sophisticated. And by the time you realize that something is wrong, it is usually too late. Connecting personal devices to operational equipment leaves a gaping hole in an otherwise tightly secured system. The phone was just plugged into a computer on the bridge network. Should I try my ghost chip program? There's something wrong with the uh, Ectis. Two ships, nothing on the radar. Yeah. Can't see anything. That's not what we show. Was there something wrong with Ectis then? This is just incredible. Now let's slow down the propulsion. We're losing speed. What's going on here? Once the malicious software has infected one computer, it may quickly spread to others connected to the same network. Think before you click. Research the facts behind emails and their attachments. Make sure external drives and USBs are clean. Be aware when third parties access your systems or data. Protect your passwords. Never connect personal items to the ship critical systems. Never use external Wi-Fi for company emails or downloads unless the network is protected and safe. Learn how backup and restore is done on board your ship. Always report errors and mistakes. Educate yourself on cyber risks and how it affects your ship, your colleagues, and you personally. Cybersecurity is just as much a question of culture and mindset as it is technology. Guard and DNVGL Hope the maritime industry will establish and follow best practices for cybersecurity awareness.
The shipping industry has various responses to these cyber attacks. In this regard, please watch the video clip on the topic related to cyber security awareness in the maritime industry of the MV GL Classification Society. The next two sliders are the last part of digitalization, the first part of this lecture. As already mentioned above, the world's first autonomous ship is a zero emission vessel powered by electricity using batteries. The Norwegian fertilizer company Yara sends about 130 loads of its products to the export port every day. This is equivalent to exporting fertilizer in about 40,000 ton loads a year. This tricking caused various problems such as emission of nitrogen oxides and carbon dioxide, generation of particular metals, dust and noise from load driving. Yara decided to solve these problems by building zero emission autonomous vessel powered by electricity eventually. The test operation of a first zero emission autonomous ship was delayed due to COVID-19, but it is expected to start commercial operation soon. In preparation for the operation of the Yara Buckland, the movement of industries related to autonomous ship is also rapid. Williamson, a leading Norwegian shipping company, and Kongsberg, a world-class ship automation equipment manufacturer, have established Masterly, the world's first autonomous shipping company. Masterly's mass real-time autonomous surface ship refers to a ship that floats on the sea level in IMO's autonomous ship classification system. The purpose of this company is to provide the entire value chain of autonomous ships from design and development to control system, logistics service, and vessel operation. The implications of Masterly are important in terms of preoccupying future business. Anyway, post move is expected to be a more likely winner in this world. This video is a document that shows the concept of an autonomous ship that rolls through things. Then uh, let's take a look at the, how the autonomous ships of the future are operated and how they are managed on land. As you can see in this slide, the World Maritime Organization is accelerating according to a set timeline with various environmental regulations related to air emission regulations of sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, and carbon dioxide, and balanced water treatment to prevent the movement of marine growth in accordance with the timeline key. The shipping and the shipbuilding industries need various strategic options and investments to respond to these regulations. 
Also, since there is no set absolute direction, ideas that fit the circumstances of each company will be very important decisions. As you can see in the previous slide, the contents of this slide have a major influence on the implementation of the regulation of nitrogen oxiders and sulfur oxiders among various regulations. In other words, as a result of measuring the amount of nitric oxide and sulfur oxide emitted from land and sea transportation, it can be seen that from 2020, the amount emitted from sea transportation will be larger than that of land. As mentioned in the previous slide, as a lot of uh, harmful exhaust gases are emitted from the sea from January 1, 2020, sulfur oxiders emission regulations called IMO 2020 came into force. This was done for the environmental benefit of reducing respiratory disease by improving air quality and preventing acid rain, soil eutrophication, and ocean acidification. This environmental regulation is that the required the use of fuel with a sulfur contents of less than 0.1% in the fuel oil of ships in some regions of the US and Europe called SECA, Special Emission Control Area from 2020, and fuel with a sulfur contents of less than 0.5% in other regions. The three methods to respond to IMO 2020 are to install a scrubber that cleans the sulfur components while using HSFO with high sulfur contents as a fuel for ships, and use LSFO or MDO or MGO with relatively low sulfur contents but expensive, and finally to use LNG. However, installing a scrubber has the disadvantage that the washed sulfur oxiders go into the sea and there are restrictions on the port of entry in some ports, but it also has the advantage that cheap fuel oil can be used. In case of using LNG, it is fundamentally impossible for existing ship because it has to be applied to new ships rather than existing ships. In this slide, it can be seen that the scrub installation has occurred rapidly in preparation for 2020. As of March 2022, 4,432 ships with a scrubber accounted for 4.3% of the existing ships, and 399 ships accounted for 9.6% of the new building vessel under construction. However, you can find that the alternative fuel and LNG-ready concept ships for future use of LNG are not enough. As mentioned earlier in this slide, scrubber have already been installed on many ships ahead of January 1, 2020. Therefore, you can find that there are no significant changes in additional installation of scrubber recently. On the other hand, the number of LNG fueled ships does not change for existing ships, but it can be seen that new ships and LNG-ready ships are gradually increasing. After the challenging task of IMO 2020, the shipping industry has to continuously carry out the new tasks of decarbonization to meet the sustainable development of goals of the United Nations. As you know, the United Nations derived the, the Paris Climate Agreement for Climate Action in number 13 in Sustainable Development Goals of UN. In accordance with the Paris Climate Agreement, IMO as an appeal rate of the United Nations establishes and implements strategies for greenhouse gas reduction in the shipping industry. IMO's ambition to achieve this strategy is a reduction of 
the average carbon intensity by 40% in 2030 and 70% in 2050 compared to 2008. And to reduce total greenhouse gas emissions from shipping by at the least 50% in 2050 compared to 2008. The strategy for greenhouse gas reduction in the shipping industry of IMO mentioned in the previous slide was adopted in April 2018. It is a schematic diagram of the content already in the previous slide. Finally, IMO has the, the plan to complete the, the general emission of the shipping industry within this century. The gray line of international shipping emission pathway shows the 2008 baseline emission, which coincidentally are nearly the same as the 2018 emissions. The yellow line shows the, the implied straight line emissions trajectory to achieve the 2050 absolute emissions reduction goal contained in the initial IMO greenhouse strategy. The light green and dark green lines show the pathways consistent with the well below 2 Celsius and the 1.5 Celsius scenario, respectively. International shipping currently emits more than 0.9 gigatons of carbon dioxide each year, and that's growing. Based on the carbon budget, Reaching zero by 2040 is aligned with limiting warming to 1.5 Celsius and zero by 2050 is aligned with well below 2 Celsius future. This slide explains what green shipping is and how much it costs. Please watch the video clip. Shipping, like aviation, accounts for just under 3% of all global emissions. That's a billion tonnes of greenhouse gases. So why do we hear so little about shipping? Probably because unlike planes, few of us will ever set foot on a container ship. And in the absence of dramatic events like the 2021 blocking of the Suez Canal, it's out of sight and out of mind. But 90% of goods are moved by sea. The majority on large vessels that run on heavy fuel oil, a leftover residue from the crude oil distillation process that is extremely polluting. Surprising then that neither the Kyoto Protocol nor the Paris Climate Accords dealt with shipping. It was left up to the UN's International Maritime Organization. In 2018, the IMO's 174 member states, many of whom are heavily reliant on shipping, agreed to cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2050 compared to 2008. This put the IMO on a collision course with organisations that introduced net zero targets, including the EU. Since 2018, ships arriving at EU ports have had to account for their fuel consumption and CO2 emissions. Now, the EU proposes that ship owners would pay for polluting by buying carbon credits not only for emissions on journeys between member states, but for 50% of voyages starting or ending at EU ports. Critics argue this is an opportunistic tax levied by the EU that will not reduce emissions. Supporters say change has to come from somewhere. That somewhere could also be from shipping itself. In 2018, Denmark's AP Moller Maersk, the second largest container shipping line in the world, pledged to go net zero by 2040. It has also undertaken to have the first carbon neutral operated vessel on the water by 2023, and recently ordered 12 container ships capable of running on carbon neutral methanol. The cost of using these new fuels will be passed on to Maersk customers, who have made their own commitments to decarbonize their supply chains. In theory, if consumers choose net zero products, net zero supply chains will be delivered. In reality, consumer choice alone will not be enough. The cost of heavy fuel oil must rise to make green fuels competitive, which will inevitably make our goods cost more, whether we like it or not.
In June 2021, new amendments were adopted to the International Maritime Organization's MAPOR Convention in the Maritime Environment Protection Committee, MEPC. The additions included the new energy efficiency requirement, energy efficiency existing ship index, EEXI, and the carbon intensity indicator, CII. These are part of the global measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from shipping. The EEXI measures carbon dioxide emissions per transport work of existing ship, purely considering the ship's design parameters. EEXI does not require any measurement or reporting of true carbon dioxide emissions while the ship is in operation. From 2023, Practically all existing ships must fall below a certain limit of carbon dioxide emissions per cargo capacity. Since the, the energy efficiency requirements have become stricter more over time, most of the old existing global fleet will not meet the new EEXI requirements. Along with the EEXI regulation, the carbon intensity indicator is coming to force in 2023. This indicator considers the actual carbon dioxide emissions in ship operation. Together, CII and EXI will significantly incentivize shipping to find and fight inefficiencies. It is also necessary to think about the, the energy transition to achieve the IMO 2050 target. This slide shows which energies will be used as main resource by IMO 2050. In the 2030s, it is predicted that the use of oil fuel will drop sharply and LNG will become the mainstream as an alternative fuel. Thus, by 2050, it is predicted that the oil fuel will be used as 0%, LNG will account for 33%, and zero carbon fuel will account for 67%. This slide introduces the various methods to achieve decarbonization and informs the reduction percent of greenhouse gas due to each applicable method. In terms of fuel and energy, it showed that the greenhouse gas can be reduced from 0 to 100%, depending on the type of energy. And currently, conventional fuel accounts for 99.5%, and the last is alternative fuel, whereas in the case of ships for construction, alternative fuel accounts for 11.84%. A system that captures and treats carbon dioxide that is generated separately from the fuel used is also receiving a lot of attention. This slide shows the liquefied carbon dioxide marine transportation and storage concept developed by KNCC, newly established by NIK of Japan and Knutsen of Norway. The developed concept idea are that the liquefied carbon dioxide generated at land and sea is directly injected into the sea bed using KNCC or injected into the sea bed through a barge on offshore or injected under the ground on land or used in other ways. This slide and the next slide will explore strategies of shipping and logistic companies for decarbonization for IMO 2050. Musk, the world's largest shipping company, recently placed an order for the world's first methanol-powered container ship, promising to make all fleet to zero carbon fleet by 2050. The Belgian tank group Urnaber and HMM of Korea decided to develop an ammonia-fueled vessel. German logistics firm DHL, which also has a 2050 net zero target, 
gives each customer the option of specifying sustainable marine fuel and aims to source 30% of its fuel requirements from sustainable sources by 2030. And Mitsui OSK Alliance has committed to deploying net zero emission ocean-going vessels this decade. This is the last slide. In this last slide, I, I would like to introduce a book titled Digital Decarbonization, published in 2022. In this book, you will learn how a significant reduction in climate changing greenhouse gas emissions can be achieved through systematic optimization of our energy systems. The authors clearly demonstrate how energy intensive processes can be optimized flexibly by using technology neutral simulation method to ensure that significantly fewer greenhouse gases are emitted. Data-based energy models described in this booklet prove that digital decarbonization enables an economy that leads significantly fewer climate changing emissions while maintaining its production output. All measures to respond to climate change and the technologies of the post-industrial revolution that we are always in contact with the, are always moving together. And when they are fused, the result will be amplified. If you have fully understand these meanings, I think this lecture will be useful to you. Thank you for listening to the lecture until the end. I wish everyone health and happiness. And also, I hope that everything you want to do will come true. Thank you.